Have you heard about Global Poker? Global Poker is the fastest growing card room in the US today, and it's available online at globalpoker.com. Global Poker is a social poker site that offers safe and secure cash out options by using their unique and patented sweepstakes model. Players can compete in big guaranteed tournaments, jackpot sit and goes, or cash games featuring Hold'em, Omaha, and even Crazy Pineapple. Don't wait. Check out Global Poker today. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales both on and off the felt. Hello and welcome to Poker Stories, a podcast brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. This is episode number 59 and features Card Player's very own Jeff Shulman. After his father Barry bought Card Player magazine, Jeff moved to Las Vegas to help him expand the business. It was at that time, in 2000, that he managed to make the final table of the World Series of Poker main event. Now, Jeff was the chip leader until he took a bad beat to eventual winner Chris Ferguson and ultimately went out in 7th place. Nine years later, he did it again. This time, Jeff navigated his way through a field of 6,494 entries to join a final table that included none other than Phil Ivey. Jeff got to five-handed play before suffering yet another bad beat, this time to the then-unknown Joe Cotta, who went on to win the tournament. Now, was it a little weird interviewing my boss? Yeah, but as it turns out, there was a lot to learn about Jeff. In this episode, of course, you'll hear how he reacted both times to those main event bad beats. But you'll also hear stories like his high stakes Bobby's Room suck out against Chao Zhang, or his experience hiring Phil Hellmuth as a poker coach, or even what he learned from baseball legend Oral Hershiser. And yes, we even talked about trash bracelets. That's enough intro, let's get to the interview. Here is my conversation with Jeff a.k.a. Happy Shulman. I am here with the one and only Jeff Shulman. Jeff, how you doing? I'm doing well, Julio. Thanks for having me. It's pretty easy to find me. Yes, uh, <laughs> that's that's my fault. It's on me. Full disclosure, um, you know, we are two and a half years into this podcast, and this is the first time I've asked you to be on. A lot of people have given me shit for it. You know, why aren't you having Barry and Jeff on? Tell the stories. Uh, but just for the audience at home, you didn't ask to be on here. I twisted your arm. <laughs> you want to tell them why? Uh, why? Why? Why do you think that is? Because all the guests are in LA right now. <laughs> I was it scrambling was a little to... bit. I was scrambling a little bit, uh, but it was going to happen eventually. And you have some unique poker perspective, being there right before the boom and after, and having made two WSB final tables, uh, main event final tables, which we will get into. But I want to start first at the beginning, 1975. February. Happy birthday, by the way. Thank you. 44. Still alive. There you go. Um, what were you getting into as a kid? It was you and, and Michael, right? Yeah. Uh, as far as gaming or poker? I or... mean, like, i got to say this is a little weird because I don't know much about you pre-card player. Oh, so about my life? Uh, we yeah. moved around a lot. My dad was a top salesman for an oil company, and uh, we grew up in Seattle, and then Next thing I know, I'm in New York, back to Seattle. Oh, New really? York I City. just assumed you were Pacific Northwest. No, I went all over, and then I went to boarding school and high school. Uh, <laughs> the, one of the more important things in my life was I went to summer camp for 12 years, and I developed some incredible friendships there. I'm sure you've read about like what summer camps can do. It made me very independent, and then by the time... This summer camp is like a... What, what is it? Uh... It was a Jewish summer camp, but I really wasn't a religious kid. But for me, it was a chance to hang out with 12 guys every day. It was like the first of everything, my first girlfriend. I could play tennis every day. Uh, just a chance to really like develop uh, without the parents. And now <laughs> that I look back on it, I was a counselor at one point, and we had like 15-year-olds being our parents. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of weird, but uh, it was great. I went to boarding school after for high school. 
Was this because you needed direction in life? Were you? Uh, were you? Uh... No, I was a real good kid. I got straight A's all throughout. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother. <laughs> I don't really want to sell him out, but at some point, <laughs> he changed his grades. He got caught. Michael's uh, older or younger? Michael's two years older than I am. Okay, so he was the bad influence, right? Yeah, but, I mean, he's not a bad guy, but... Uh, Wait, how, what do you mean change the grades? Was this, like, war games? Was he, like, uh... No, this was low-tech. Okay. Uh, the report card came in yellow. <laughs> uh, his was a white Xerox copy. My parents didn't know because I think he may have changed mine to a white Xerox also about the same grades. <laughs> Got to cover your tracks. He went in for, like, the parent-teacher conference, and the teacher said, I'd like to talk about Michael, and... Mm -hmm. They said, why? He got an A. I'm like, A, he got a D. Now, <laughs> you know, being in the poker world or I guess hustling if you're a gambler, you don't go from a D to an A. Yeah. You have to be smooth and maybe a D to a C. Anyhow. <laughs> he went too uh, big too fast. <laughs> he ended up going. To, <laughs> uh, they said maybe he does need a little discipline in his life, but they sent him to one of the greatest prep schools in the country. And when I went to visit, it was like summer camp. Where was this in? Uh, it was in Connecticut. And. I went to visit and these guys were hanging out and the, I played a lot of tennis at the time and the tennis court was 10 steps from the dorm and there's hockey. <laughs> we, you know, we didn't have hockey. We didn't have lacrosse. And as like a fan of sports, anything that I wanted was there. Uh, it's like summer camp during the year. Yeah. And then exactly. And then after. You just really wanted to get away from your parents. <laughs> Or maybe they wanted to get <laughs> away from me. Because now that I'm a parent, which mm -hmm. we'll get into in a little bit, yeah, I can't imagine my kids losing that four years uh, of my kids. Yeah. Now things are different now. But what boarding school did is it made college seem like a joke to me. Everything, it was easy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, people go to college, they put it on your 15 pounds. I did that two years earlier. Uh, <laughs> but I was ready for the college experience and I was quite independent. And then I think that goes all the way back to, of course, how my parents raised me. I did laundry in fifth grade. Uh, a lot of people still were taking laundry home in college. And as I said, camp boarding school mm -hmm. all made me get to where I'm at now. So you had, a, you had a hard work ethic early on when you didn't really have to. I was a procrastinator. I did do all my stuff. I never missed an assignment. But I remember waking up at five or six in the morning instead of doing it at night. Yeah. Uh, firm advocate of playing hard, working hard <laughs> instead of the other way around. But I was, or work smart, not hard. Yeah. <laughs> but my dad is a total ass kicker who works hard, smart, but will work 10 times more hours than anyone else. And he's constantly thinking about it. Uh, there is a generational difference there. And his yeah. dad was twice as tough as he was. But we came from good genes. And I think that helped out. And I was always, as a kid, able to go into his office while he was having business meetings and just kind of learn. Yeah. And it was great. But, uh, I know this is a poker podcast a little bit, so where well, did I start? Was it summer camp? Yeah. Uh, we used to play five-card draw. I learned how to play bridge in, like, fourth grade. I don't really know all the rules anymore, but I understood, like, how the trump worked and cards and reading people. Mm -hmm. But this all started early on. And so then, it wasn't your parents, your grandparents that got you into cards. It was these kids in at the summer camp. It was kids at summer camp and then at boarding school I played spades every night. It was mm -hmm. the same four of us for like two years to the point that we knew exactly what each other had just by looking and it was <laughs> almost like the Chip and Doyle had played with each other for so many years you just know. Yeah. Um, and it's just I loved the game. You know as a kid there's uh, Candyland and life and all those things but I guess another thing I, that I want to talk about with the boarding school that it gave me was my brother and I had different – he didn't like the game. Uh, we weren't the same type of people. So he wasn't the guy who was going to go play tennis with me. He wouldn't go play mm -hmm. catch with me. So oh, I was okay. like I needed that from other people. From yeah. as kids growing yeah. up. Uh, anyhow, uh, once we get to college – once I got to college uh, – Wait, well, real quick. Before you get to college, because I know you went to UW, uh, University of Washington – uh, what were you getting as a, into as a kid? You mentioned tennis. You're obviously freakishly tall. You know, I'm assuming you were pretty athletic. So I played football from fifth grade through high school. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my favorite. For people who haven't played football, yes, it's dangerous as can be, but it has a bond unlike any I've ever dealt with. And it's I assume it's like Hell Week or living in the Army or just you 
sweat with the guys and it's yeah. just non-stop and it's, it's like a fraternity. Did you play? Uh, I was defensive end until I hurt my shoulder and then at first I was a tight end and moved to receiver for my last few years. I was okay. the slowest receiver ever. <laughs> Linemen were running faster than I was, but I just could put catch. put the ball up high. You faded to the end, to the yeah. corner of the end zone. I couldn't adjust either. It had to, <laughs> it had to be thrown perfectly, but I'd make the catch. Yeah. Um, and then getting to college was kind of fun because I was going to go to Washington University in St. Louis. I got in early. And I remember there was this exact moment where I decided not to go to Washington University and go to University of Washington. Yeah. Two totally different schools. Two totally two One's an academic and one's country, uh, yeah. in Seattle, and it's a big school. Because in the one in St. Louis is, like, super prestigious. Yeah, yeah. it's. Pro- I don't know what it is now, but at the time it was probably, like, 15th in the country in mm-hmm. you know, UWW. And it was mm-hmm. one of my buddies from fifth grade, and I remember I was on the phone with him, and he said, you want to go to Washington University in St. Louis? And I was like, yeah, it's great. He's like, St. Louis is a shithole. <laughs> and I'll never forget that. And that line made me not go to Washington that was University. All it took. That's what it took. Kids are influenced by whatever they hear. So, yeah. Uh, then Do I you went ever to think UW. back, like, how different your life would have been if you'd gone the more academic route? Of course. Uh, I'm glad I took the, the route that I did because I'm pretty happy with the of laissez-faire course. attitude I've lived. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you think you'd be doing? You, th- you think you'd be playing poker? No, what, I'd what probably be like a computer scientist. I wanted yeah. to be a lawyer for a long time. And there was another one-minute conversation that I had with my dad. And he said, <laughs> when you're my age, do you want to work 60 hours a week or play golf for 60 hours a week? And I was like, wow, uh, obviously golf, but I haven't played yet. So <laughs> I'll take the it business. better route. than working. And he always said, if you get successful at business, you can make money while you sleep. And you cannot do that as an attorney. You could be yeah. the best attorney and make all the money in the world, but you still have to put in the hours. That's interesting. And now he says that with a wife who's a former lawyer. Yeah, but he thinks he's the attorney. <laughs> or he thinks he's better than the attorney. <laughs> All right, so uh, we are at University of Washington. You are studying what? Uh, I was political science and economics, mm-hmm. and I wouldn't really say I studied. I I think I got like a 3-4, somewhere around there, which was decent, but in the fraternity life, it was how little you could work and how good of a grades you could get while yeah. still having fun. Um, so I barely went to classes. I studied. <laughs> I got did every assignment. But it was such a big school that you could really just do your term paper, show up for the midterm, show up for the final. Yeah. Uh, Same when, with I was, when I was 50, older. in a class, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we had 600 and then in a couple classes. And then my senior year, I was in a class with 20 people. I tried to do the same route of not showing up every day. And halfway through, the guy said, my professor, he's like, oh, by the way, if you miss any more classes, you're not going to graduate. <laughs> or you're going to fail this class, and then it's going to be another, Yeah, you, you have to, to take yeah, another come back semester. Another semester. And I was thinking, huh, my parents would not be down with that at all. <laughs> so I went to the classes, and I passed that class. and Got your degree? Got my degree, and I started working. Uh, well, what was, what was Barry doing at this time? Because I imagine, you know, he had – uh, endeavors that you were kind of looking at maybe to get into or were you just like no I'm going to go opposite so at that time he probably bought card play already he really I thought I thought uh, poker didn't come until later well he bought card player I believe while I was still in college and I remember I just got season tickets for the Mariners which is a big deal for me because I could finally afford it. And I was going to Mariners games all the time. And he's like, hey, you got to come down here at some point. And I was like, eh, they're moving into a new stadium. And this is, of course, a kid yeah. that didn't have his priorities straight. So I I got the call, and he's like, hey, I need you help on the family business, or this is your chance. So I left my job, and at the time I was doing land acquisition, uh, meaning I was going out and taking land from old people and <laughs> – when I say take it, my company would pay him a lot of money, uh, and we'd do it on our terms. Right. And it's kind of like we strung him out for a couple of years, even though we were paying, and then we'd close. These guys would make a ton of money, and I'd make my $28,000 a year uh, right out of college, even though I was making my company well over a million. Uh, 
But the idea was you would go to individual owners of lands to get a big patch of land? Yeah, and the fact that I was 21 at the time, these guys loved talking to me, and I was pretty good at just going out and really showing them what they could make. And a lot of these guys had their land for years, but it was at the point that they wanted to cash out because the Seattle market had started to grow. Uh, And our company would pay more than other people, but it was always in like two years from the time and then we'd put down earnest money and kind of string them out for a couple of years and i didn't think about that at the time as stringing them out but now that i'm older i realize yeah what i was doing it's kind of shady <laughs> and uh one of my friends uh emily who was a teacher at the time said er, does this fulfill you and i said putting asphalt on nice property no uh and then i was like okay uh maybe it's time to head down to vegas and wow it's crazy pressured. you're so easily influenced by one-liners <laughs> <laughs> it's true and now I, now that I've been in the poker world for as long as I have, uh, I don't believe anything and I'm not influenced at all. So I'm kind of like you, Julio, playing so, the devil's advocate at exactly, all Exactly, exactly. Just always assume the worst. So so Emily convinces you uh, that land acquisition isn't for you. Mm-hmm. And Barry says, come work for me. Doing what? So he didn't really have a card player job available uh, except – I'd call it the son's business, but I was managing his apartments. He owned a couple 200-unit complexes mm-hmm. here in town, and I was managing those, and I think I had a vice president title at Card Player. And what I was doing was kind of securing some of the big deals, going and meeting the casino owners with him, and eventually I took over the role. Because this is all pre-boom. This is what, like late 90s, early uh, 2000s? I moved down here in 2000 in 2000 so oh so you had that was the year you obviously went deep in the wsp main event um that was right away right away oh and so i want to back move it up here and then boom you're you're hitting you're playing yes but i do want to back it up a spec uh to a sec uh they both i went work. to go play <laughs> seven card stud for the first time at a casino and i won is like i think one to five that's how it worked and i must have won like five hundred dollars wow and I thought it was the hottest thing out there. And I called dad. And I was like, I did this, 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 this. And he's like, you did it all wrong. He's like, you have no chance of winning. Like, you may win one more day, but it's all going to go away within like a week if you try to play that way. And I was like, what? And he said, here's some books. And he sent me a couple books. And I realized, wow, I was just gambling and got lucky. Uh, so I read all these books and I figured, wow, poker is like really, really tight if you want to win. And then I... <laughs> I started playing 4-8 Hold'em at a casino up north of Seattle. I won a couple tournaments, uh, like $10 no-limit tournaments, so I started to feel like I was getting better. But I was driving 45 miles to play a 4-8 Hold'em game. Yeah. And then Dad said, hey, you know, when I used to live in Seattle, there's a place that's 10 minutes from your house, and they have 1020. And I went there, and the first five minutes of playing position made sense to me even though I'd already played for two years. It all clicked. But until you're playing a little higher limit, the position really isn't a factor. And then I started coming down to Vegas, and I played, a, like I think it was like 15.30 at Bellagio, doing well there, I started to play tournaments. Uh, and while I was working, I was going to the Orleans every night and playing in their, I don't even remember, $20, $30, $40 tournaments, playing a $200 little yeah. Hold'em tournament on Sunday. And at some point, uh, like six months in, I was so tired and I couldn't figure it out. And I realized that playing poker took more energy than working because it's you have to be on every yeah. single second. At least at the time, that's how I played. It's mentally exhausting, and you're probably not taking care of yourself. You're sitting, yeah. not eating sometimes, forgetting to eat, yeah. skipping meals. But it was fun. And the yeah. fact that I could play with people that weren't at all like me, whether they're old or different. Back then, they were, they were old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I was friends with all these guys, and it was a blast. And it back to the whole summer camp mentality, it's like the same people showed up yeah. all the time, and it was so much fun. That's interesting that the game was introduced to you by your friends at summer camp, but it was Barry who kind of said, no, 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 you're doing it all wrong. Like, I'll obviously ask him in another two and a half years when he gets on this podcast uh, uh, about his poker origin story. But the fact that he was kind of like encouraging you uh, to come out to Vegas, I guess, and do yeah. it differently. Well, and his point was you have to play tight. And then, of course, I get here, 
And all I heard was stories about how he's the biggest maniac on the tour. <laughs> and he moved in, you know, for 100X with, like, a King 3. Mm-hmm. Gets called by the Aces. Of course, he hits two parrot. But I just heard the story over and over, and people kept on playing me the same way they'd play him, except the difference was I'd always have the hands. That's interesting. Cause and I, then that brings me to the World Series. We'll go to the World Series because, uh, so you moved to Vegas in 2000. The series comes around in June-ish, mm-hmm. May maybe. Uh, back then, and what was your experience like at the World Series prior to that? Uh, I played Super Satellites. Okay. And I must have got three out of the money and like 15 Super Satellites in a row, <laughs> and I couldn't figure out what I was doing wrong. And uh, my dad and Randy Holland, who is a great player, sat me down, and they talked about, hey, you can't blind off. And I kind of felt like I was one of the first people to really figure out how super satellites work at that point because I was winning at least two out of every three for a long time. Yeah. And then people were coming up to me like, what are you doing? And it was like shove or fold for like once once you can no longer rebuy. And I was shoving for 40 times the blind. And it worked every single time except once I did that <laughs> and I had Kings. Uh, and I remember I got called and I was like, oh, no. It was Mike Saxon, he had aces, and he busted me out, and that was, like, the only time that I remember <laughs> busting out of a super satellite that year from something like that. I mean, there's other times you get in with the worst, but because you have to move in with the worst. There are people listening right now that go, "That's some, that, you're exaggerating. That's ridiculous. It was awesome. But I, I'm really... I really thought I was the best <laughs> super satellite player in the world, but then it's like I decided, yeah. okay, it's time to play in the main event. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even have $10,000 to my name that, I mean, I had a job that was paying, but I was spending, and... The thought of putting up ten thousand. You didn't have an extra ten k to blow. Yeah. No, I, yeah. it was just way too much, and I got there and I remember I was so nervous. I must have gone to the bathroom five times in the first hour, <laughs> uh, just running out, missing hands, trying to figure out what I was doing. I was sweating, and I'm not like I don't think I ever got nervous in sports. So this was new to me, but it's like after you win your first hand, like even now, like at the World Series main event. I'm a little shaky till I bring in, like, the first pot. And then it's like I have to, like, shake off my hands a little bit, and then it's, like, go time. Yeah. Everyone's uh, shivering in the, in the Amazon room, and they're saying it's because it's so cold. Yeah. Well, this is a, <laughs> Half the people are just nervous as hell. This is a Binion's. And there was stuff right, going right. on at Binion's saying, like, at the time that was also today. pretty sketchy where they were trying to tell people you can't talk about what was going on behind the scenes. Uh, I had friends that were, like, threatened by management right so this was a, an interesting year at the world series of poker uh it was chronicled in james mcmanus's book positively fifth street which i will quote from in a minute <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah this was the year that binions was going through some drama with uh the the whole murder trial and um becky and you know changing hands and um obviously 512 entrants in that main event I don't know how many people were paying attention to you once they got to the money because there were a lot of big names left in the field, uh, including two women, um, Deep, Kathy Liebert and Annie Duke, both made the final two tables. What was your uh, attention attention like back then? Were people paying attention to you at all? Or no, it's kind of like when you watch. TJ? It's kind of like when you watch golf on TV. That if you're not one of the leaders, you're not even on TV. Yeah. And I was kind of bottom ten percent, bottom ten percent. And if I remember, it must have been day three, and I had kings maybe seven times that day, and I doubled through every single time. And out of nowhere, I went from not having chips to I heard my name as, like, chip leader. I was like, what? Me? (laughs) And, of course, back then I was tight aggressive, but... I had like a little leak where any ace I would just re-raise. So it's like I was tight aggressive with the exception of like these weak aces. Mm-hmm. And I never thought that I was aggressive, but I remember Scotty Wynn like, saying like, this is the most aggressive kid I've ever played with. Right. And one of my friends later said it was like I was like the internet kid before there was the internet. That's what I'm getting to because in the book, McManus describes you as a maniac, you know, very aggressive. Basically, you had so many chips and would raise – pretty much every other hand and they couldn't play back again. It was just you and TJ going back and forth with the chip lead uh, as the field got into the money and played down. Um, 
Well, there was, was a it very... really that easy though? Like, was it, like, you weren't just stealing just to steal back then? No, it, no, it was back to I didn't play the small ball. I played big ball, and I remember there was a very interesting hand that came down. Uh, I think a guy's name was Angelo, and then Mike Sexton, where I limped under the gun with like pocket fives or sixes or something like that, uh, kind of representing aces because I never really limped, and then. Remember when you could limp and represent aces? Yeah. Or, you know what? Maybe it was tens or something. I, I can't remember. I think it was That made tens. sense back then. But tens were the same for me as one of the bad hands at the yeah. time. Now I love them, of course. Uh, and I remember oh, I poker. I limped and Sexton raised, or Angelo raised and Sexton, like, moved in. And it's like I, like, played it all back in my head. And I remember thinking, like, I have the best hand. Am I going to really, like, call off all my chips here? Because it was Sex and I were close, and I did. I don't remember exactly what he had, but I think I had him dominated. And I took him out, and I remember him shaking his head like that was, like, the worst call I've ever seen. And to me, I was thinking, like, that was the worst shoving I've ever seen because I, I was so good and so focused at the time. Uh, I definitely think I was one of the better people at reading, which I can no longer do the same mm-hmm. as I used to. And, you know, at some point I'm sure we'll talk about the – bust out hand yeah which to me was black and white but you know things change i wouldn't do it now <laughs> yeah so you're you take out sexton uh annie duke goes out in 10th mickey appleman in ninth tom franklin in eighth uh i mean just to give a an idea of the type of poker going on i found this hilarious hand history from mcmanus in the book the blinds were 3k 6k and he just open raised to thirty one thousand from a stack of about 100k with queens and then he was shy about calling it off when he got re-raised all in so back then people were you know five five and a half xing pre-flop and with queens and being scared about it so that just goes to show you what a little aggression could do for you at the final table yeah and i got so many chips at one point that i had almost half the chips in play and i remember i was i think we must have been at like 50,000, 100,000 at the time because I was just bringing it in for 300,000 and I was almost contemplating just playing the super satellite and just shoving every single hand because at this point I was going to get first. Like In my mind, there's no doubt. Uh, and then I... Chip leader, seven-handed, raising every pot, enough that McManus calls you Lucifer in, <laughs> in the book. Do you remember this? <laughs> No, I don't remember that. He says you were Luciferian. Then he calls you Lucifer. When I think it, he was trying to play off the whole Ferguson is Jesus thing, mm-hmm. so he needed a, he calls you Beelzebub later on. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Yeah, um, but yeah, then the then the infamous hand goes down. You're crew. You're in cruise control. Right. I've, I Seven have twice as many left. chips as the next guy. So to me, it's like, okay, can I win it all tonight? And this yeah. guy Jack Fox came up to me and he said, hey. Don't forget, you can't win this tournament tonight. And I was like, I think I can. Because <laughs> there was still another day. and Right, they wanted to stop at six players. I remember at this specific time, I decided to raise a little more on the button because I've been watching Ferguson do this shove over and over. But these guys were like shoving with small players. They were playing like big aces differently. And I raised with sevens a little more than usual. And just like... I... Well, it says you raised a 200K on the button. So I don't know what the okay, blinds so, were. Well, if I raised 200K on the button, then at that time, instead of 3X, it must have been 4X. So that's what yeah. the blinds were. Uh, oh, no. You know what it was? It was, uh, like I think it was 15,000, 30,000. I made it 6X instead of 3X. Okay. Enticing the all-in. And it happened. And that's I remember. It's so crazy that that was a play that would entice on an all-in back then. And it's so much different than I play now. Yeah. I mean, if you saw me play now, you'd be like, how weak are you? Yeah. <laughs> but he did it and I stood up and I raised my hands in the air before the cards were flipped over because I understood exactly what he had. And it was almost like I could see it. Now I lost the hand. He had sixes, I had sevens. And I remember even though he hit the six, I still had the straight draw flush draw. Uh, I didn't improve, but all it did is it made it where Chris had me covered and I still had, I think Chris, you know, is the equivalent of him having a million, I had like 900,000 and everyone else had two or 300,000. But I really wasn't concerned except the very next hand. Well, before we get to that, <laughs> before we get to that, I have a question here because the book says, and I can't believe this is real. This has got to be dramatic for the purposes of the book. But you raise the 200K on the button. 
And Ferguson thinks for a moment, and someone in the audience yells, what would Jesus do? Is that true? Uh, I just wasn't paying attention. <laughs> that just seems very... The you only know. thing I remember the audience the whole day was the very next hand because, mm -hmm. uh, so yes, I don't remember that. But on the next hand, which was my bust out hand, TJ raised and I shoved with Kings and then Ferguson had aces in the big blind. He called and this guy from the crowd yelled, TJ has to fold, TJ has to fold. And I remember thinking like, what come on, TJ can figure this out on his own. He's TJ. Like, yeah. Since when does the crowd get to determine, like, what happens? Uh, and then... And he did fold jacks. He, okay, he folded jacks. Uh, Ferguson won the hand, and I was so pumped. I won, like, 130000 And I was just, like, the happiest man on earth. Until, what? Until the next day. And I was driving the card player, and I pulled over on the side of the road, and I just, like, broke down, and I was like, holy shit. I, I could have been champion of this poker. Like, yeah. what a joke poker is that... Some kid out of nowhere can just outplay everyone. Yeah. At least I thought I was outplaying everyone and that I truly should have been champion. Uh, and now I look back on it. There's no way in today's game I'd call a sevens. Uh, and I remember all these guys were criticizing me. I wrote an article about like how I played and kind of went into depth on every single hand, kind of like Gus did later on about uh, the Aussie millions. And a guy, Lee Salem, very, he's just a stud poker player. I corrected people at the table, and they're like, hey, man, you've never been there. Don't tell them how he should have done it. You don't know. Mm -hmm. You weren't the one playing. And I agree. It's like when you're in the heat of the battle, everything's different on the sidelines. You're the one who knows what's going on. You're the one who's right. picking up on the tells. You made a great call with sevens against sixes, which in hindsight is a little reckless considering ICM, which no one knew about at the time. And people were giving patting you on the back saying, hey, you made the right play. But no, everyone was saying I made the wrong play. Oh, even though you, you were ahead. I had 95% of the people thought I had the wrong play even though Adam dominated. Yeah. Uh, and now I would think it's the wrong play because it could have been me throwing the cards through the carrots on TV <laughs> like wow. Ferguson did. Or bananas, <laughs> I guess, not carrots. It's hard to cut a carrot. Well, what, what was your impression of Ferguson back then? Like, was he wasn't... I mean, we, he didn't win winning, but... We only played for those five minutes. Uh, he wasn't one someone that I played with a lot. I played a lot of events that year at the World Series, and I was cashing, breaking even, but it was kind of having a good time and just yeah, getting my poker training wheels on. Um, and I've always been the limit hold'em player. I really enjoyed no limit at the time, and that's changed in the last few years because of all the tanking and the people covering their faces. It's just... I don't think No Limit's fun. It's stressful. It takes too long. Mm -hmm. uh, Limit Hold'em, you can make a call within a quarter of a second for your biggest decision. It's very That's quick. how I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I thought you were just a Limit Hold'em player beforehand, and that's what you stuck with. Well, cash, I was always Limit Hold'em. I played very little No Limit. Uh, I was playing – back then there wasn't cash No Limit games. There mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, the Cameo Club, which was California. Yeah, this was pre-Money and we went down to Costa Rica, and I was playing No Limit, and I remember playing like twenty five fifty No Limit, which is pretty big, especially for me at the time. And I made a comment at the table because like, I was about to leave that the only hand I'd play right now is aces. <laughs> and I shove in. This guy decides to call me with Ace King, and I lost like six thousand dollars on the hand. <laughs> and I was like, I don't think I want to play live No Limit anymore. Yeah, it's just it's a gut punch. Yeah. At least in a tournament, punch. like you go home and it's like you get to try again some other time. All right, so you come back to card player, um, still reveling in your big run. Uh, the poker boom is is happening. It's in the process of building. You were here during that stretch when there was insane things happening in the poker room. I mean, uh, at one point when I was an intern, I walked into a room and half the cast of that 70s show was hanging out with card player because they're part owners or something like that, right? Yeah, so... I mean, of course, the poker boom is the Moneymaker World Series, which I played with Moneymaker at the first table. <laughs> uh, and I remember thinking, like, hey, I think maybe I sit next to him, like, what a great name. And I don't remember exactly what I got that year, somewhere 30s or 40s. But at some point, I was at the table with Ivy and Moneymaker and Letter. And I did this, like, super routine play that ended up doubling up Phil Ivy. But if you know how to play poker, it's like, I was pot committed and I had yeah. the call and 
Norman Chad ridiculed me. And at that point, I was like, well, this guy knows absolutely nothing about poker. <laughs> and I even he said on TV, he's like, that's like giving the keys to Charles Manson. Uh, <laughs> and I thought, maybe you should ask 100 pros. And I think maybe 99 of them would say, yeah. Now, I remember Howard wasn't psyched that I doubled up Phil when he was to his left. And, you know, to me, Phil was just a cool guy who was good at poker. Yeah. He wasn't like the Phil Ivey yet. But so I think that's when the boom happened, and obviously card player took off, poker took off. It was on TV. Uh, TV really made the poker, showing the whole cards. Uh, World Poker Tour, there's all the online sites. And then uh, at the same time, I got married to Christy, and we ended up going down to the World Poker Tour celebrity event. And I remember she got a picture with Ben Affleck that I still put up like every year on Facebook at the Oscars saying, hey, look who we ran into at the Oscars. <laughs> but I sat next to uh, Chris Masterson at the time, and we became really good friends. And I didn't know about his relationship at the time with Laura Prepon. And one day he called. He's like, hey, can you give my girlfriend a lesson? I was like, yeah, sure. Like, yeah, we'll come down. Yeah. Uh, and it ended up being Laura Prepon. And in their the home redhead game, from uh, that, that 70s, 70s show. show. Mm-hmm. Orange is the New Black. Right. Yeah. Uh, but at the time... Chris was also in Malcolm in the Middle. I mm-hmm. think he was the older brother. and then Funniest character of that show, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and then in their home game, of course, was Danny, his brother, a uh, couple other Hollywood guys that were in their crew, and, you know, their friends that they grew up with. And it was such a fun game. And we'd fly down, like, maybe once every two weeks and just play with these guys because it was fun. And then uh, we ended up selling, uh, like, five or 10% of card player off to some of my friends in the industry. And uh, the three of them bought 1% combined and, you know, we fill home with people like that. And uh, it was, poker was so big at that time. Yeah. That people were quitting their Wall Street jobs <laughs> to become poker players. Uh, and then at some point we were like, hey, I, maybe you shouldn't quit your real job. Yeah, don't quit the day player. job. But it was so hot and the celebrities thought that the poker players were the celebrities, and I never understood that. These guys were, like, kissing Mike Mattis's ass. And, uh, but I missed, like, the real the first year of the World Poker Tour because uh, I got married at the time, and just poker wasn't as important to me. But that was really such a big year to developing who you were to the public. And, like, is that important? Is it not important to me? It would be important if, as far as the money and, but I'm not a guy who wants to like be represented by a site. I'm not the guy, like dad always said, like if I won that world series with the Ferguson time that he's like, you'll be on Johnny Carson. I was like, I'm not going on Johnny Carson. I'm not even going to do an interview. I was like, I'll do one with card player, but I was like, I don't like the public, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, an anxious guy. So. That didn't, I don't know if it was from, uh, that didn't stop you from the Poker Superstars Invitational Series, which was Well, that's funny. Televised. So I got off, uh, we got off our honeymoon, and I was invited to the Poker Superstars, uh, which was pretty much like playing 10 super satellites. And I was like, okay. And it cost like $50,000, uh, but I was kind of pumped up from poker at the time. So I was like, okay. And this was every single stud in poker uh and i did pretty well because i just played my super satellite and i like crushed the field until it got down to like a three-handed and i remember it was like maybe me myself gus and madiso and that was the beginning of gus owning me (laughs) where i couldn't do anything right it's either i had the biggest tell in the world and he would either just outplay me every single hand where i'd call off with the loser or I'd fold the winner. It's like, I didn't know what to do. And I eventually, in the like, different type of game, because I took care of the super satellite round, uh, I couldn't beat him. But uh, at the time, I had some like serious anxiety issues, and I was just trying to figure out what was going on with my body while I was playing. But, you know, I survived. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, I played in that, and I did it mostly – to promote card player because it was going to be on TV and I was wearing the card player stuff and card players are family business. That was not about me as a person. That was just strictly business. So you've always, you know, shied away from the limelight, but you can't avoid it if you make the final table again. Right. I, again, I tried, uh, and 
what happened there was... 2009. Yeah, fast forward to 2009. Ivy's at the table now. Yeah, but let's back up to the beginning. Yeah. I just ran over the table on the first day. Just, you know, they talk about luck at the World Series of Poker, and the luck is, more than anything, table draw. And okay. I had a very soft table, and I just ran over it, and I think you started with 10,000 at the time, and I must have had 90,000, whereas usually I'd be happy with <laughs> doubling up. And then I ended up at the table with Elkie, a TV table, and I was like, oh, no. Uh, and I'm not a guy who believes in wearing sunglasses at all because I think it's a huge advantage you're hiding behind them. Uh, even wearing glasses, you can feel like you're hiding behind them a little bit. But I was with a very bright light on the TV table. Dan Harrington was there also. And I got involved in a hand with Elky, which I'm really not a trash talker, but because he was so big time, <laughs> I ended up... The cameras I, got to you. Yeah. No, it wasn't the cameras, because to me, the cameras weren't there. But I outplayed Elkie on a hand with, like, some, like, wimpy betting that was so small. And then I made fun of him, not even thinking it was on the cameras. And eventually, that was on TV. And Elkie, like, had a bad run for, like, the next couple of years. And my friends, like, insisted that it was because of this <laughs> stupid play I made. But uh, I kept on just being – I kept on surviving. I had, like, ace-king, and people were moving in with king-queen. And to me – at the time, there was, like, black and white in poker. and it's Well, black and white on how to play the main event, mm -hmm. which is don't be an idiot. And I just watched people, like, screw up over and over and over. And I kept on winning the hands that I was supposed to win, uh, which, you know, at some point, you're going to lose a three to one. Yeah. And I must have won ten of those. So that was lucky. And then I end up getting to the final table. There were so many weird things that happened. You weren't shaving. I got to bring this up. Are you a superstitious person? Because you said you weren't going to shave throughout the entire run. I don't know what I say, Julio. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff just comes out of my mouth every <laughs> once in a while. Uh, makes sense. I, I, sure. I didn't shave. I remember I was wearing like a fish hoodie and uh, I like the hoodie because it kind of covered me up a little bit. But now I'm very against the concept of that because it's like, hey, play. Yeah. You know, tells are part of the game if you have tells, but... These guys that cover their faces up. And I didn't know what to do because you're playing so hard for nine days and then it just stopped. And as I said, I'm an anxious person. And I'd even like tell my friends back home. Then people are like, hey, I heard you made the final table. I was like, yeah, yeah. And then we went to Seattle for the summer and I wasn't even watching the videos because I didn't want to see myself That's on crazy. TV. You weren't I didn't prepping play. with that, huh? People were like, playing and playing and playing. I didn't play a hand of poker until about a month before. So we stopped in July and it probably wasn't till October where Diego's like, Hey, you got to start playing poker again. Yeah. And I didn't realize how big poker was until like, as it started getting closer, I remember just going to some hotel in Seattle to meet one of my friends and like the valet guy's like, Hey, you're the guy on TV. And my friend's like, Hey, you've been on TV more than Brett Favre this year. And I'm like, <laughs> Oh gosh. So, uh, Diego insisted, and my dad, that we form, like, a team to practice for the main event. And Phil Helmuth called me, and he said, hey, I'd like to help you out. And I was like, okay. So we got Phil and Mark Gregorich and uh, Diego and Adam. Uh, what, was, what was Phil's deal? Like, just In general? Help? Well, I mean, did he want, like, an upfront payment? Did he want, like, a cut of your winnings? Or? It was, uh, we made it, it was strictly on, I was in fifth place at the time. Okay. And I think it was if I ended up getting a top three. Uh, by the way, Earl Hershiser was also part of the group. And he wasn't an equal in the poker level as these guys, but clearly he understands yeah. the big picture on how to prepare to for stuff series. like that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's like the real athlete. <laughs> but So Phil was going to get paid nicely if I got in the top three. And when we were in these training sessions – there's, you know, a few things that he said that really stuck out, which is, like, sometimes you have to lose a hand and you just move on. Uh, but what we did is we – Diego had a printout of how every single person played there. Mm -hmm. And it was each person played the exact role of the player at the table. So, you know, maybe Phil was Darvin Moon. He wasn't Phil Helmuth. Uh, and that was pretty helpful. So, so everyone Diego basically did took all on that. a personality. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
And we just played these out, but of course there's so much play that we never actually finished, but it was just doing this. And then as we got closer and Phil and I were going to have a whole heads up thing once we got there, because I was really good at getting seventh places, fifth places, but yeah. I had like zero wins and he's a guy who can finish and finishing is important because that's where all the money is. Mm-hmm. And I used to get upset with my friends who were like, yeah, I got second. I was like, great. You lost half the money. <laughs> I mean, but that's how the discrepancy of first and second, uh, and about Oral, I want to point this out. When we walked into that huge arena the day, Oral walked me in, and he said, like, vision, all the people here. It's the Penn and Teller Theater. Yes. And he said, imagine this. And he was kind of helping me on the mental game, which was, like, really cool because mm-hmm. I was a baseball fan. Uh, and while I was watching baseball, Oral had one of the greatest runs. And that's in front of 60,000 people plus TV. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, there was the – lead up uh i always like to tell this story uh before sorry i'm going like back and forth no that's fine so the one time i was watching espn we weren't watching myself yet on the world series but i was just watching (laughs) sports center and a promo came up and it went ivy shulman ivy shulman like showing both of our faces and my friend matt lefkowitz called and he just said are you an equal I was like, equal? Uh, no. <laughs> you know, I was just happy to be there. Yeah, just to get mentioned. Right. And wow, one I of the stories true. that people always talk about for this World Series that got, like, way more press than me as a player was that I made a comment about throwing the bracelet in the I was going to bring this up, but I'm glad you did. Uh, because at the time you make this comment, I mean, obviously it had more to do with Kevin, Politics. Uh, Jeff Pollock, who was running the World Series at the time. And then later went on to uh, run uh, the Epic Poker League into the ground uh, before now. I think he works for but the XFL. The reason for this was mm-hmm. strictly a card player. We had a deal and Jeffrey Pollock backed out of the deal without telling us. So mm-hmm. we already had like the exclusive rights and we had a deal and somehow he like at the last sec took it away from us, gave it to someone else. So it was more of like just a lack of respect for the World Series. Mm-hmm. Now, I had total respect for Ty Stewart, who was his number two guy at the time, who now is the head guy at the World Series. Yeah. Um, and it was just, it was a stone throwaway line. But I guess there's no such thing as a throwaway line. That was pre-social media, but it was a, uh, it was caught. It was early camera. social uh, media. Early social media. Yeah. And then that's all everyone wanted to talk about. But Right. You did this whole interview, and at the end they say, hey, what would you do with the bracelet? And you say, I'm going to throw in the trash. Right. Now, if you look at me, I don't wear a watch. I don't wear my wedding ring. Like, jewelry mm-hmm. alone isn't my thing. I didn't have kids at, eh, I did have kids at the time, but <laughs> I guess now it'd be something that I'd want to give to my kids or my wife. But you know, at the, I'm just trying to play poker. Yeah. And when it's it was 2 a.m. Yeah. 2 a.m. After playing for 10 hours, you shouldn't ever be interviewed. And I've always <laughs> said that like with these, with all the poker players, they're not able to communicate when you're focused for that long, that all the interviews should be the next day because people say stupid things. Uh, and it, again, it was nothing, but it turned into something. <laughs> it turned into something. You got a little bit of grief for it. Um, obviously, the the final table plays out. You seem to be doing very well until a very. Uh, it's funny because in in the book in two thousand you were described as as the whippersnapper. At twenty five, how old were you at twenty three when you made that final table? In uh, two thousand twenty five. 25 and 2000. The book says you were 23. Jim, get that right. Anyway, uh, they called you a whippersnapper, and then all of a sudden you're at this final table in 2009 with Ivy, Darwin Moon, and there's that young kid, Joe Cotta, um, and he ends up getting you. Yeah, and it was funny because I had, like, everyone has 100 of their friends in the crowd, and I remember, like, my friends were, like, just yelling these references that only I'd understand that had nothing to do with it. And like there's quoting a, fish lyrics to you? Yeah, just just <laughs> stupid Seattle stuff. And uh, there's a hand that I had Ace King, and I really think, like, one of my friends in the crowd, like, yelled something, and it convinced him to move in with Ace Jack, and I got a bunch of his chips there. But uh, on this one Joe Catta hand, I think he may have, like, open raised, and I re-raised with Jacks, and then he shoved with threes, and... Not true at all, but I can tell you the exact hand history if you'd like. Yeah. Yeah, you opened from under the gun, and then he jammed for, like, 10x on top of that. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. 
But <laughs> same hands. Yeah. By the way, Phil Helmuth used to always say, if you're going to tell me a poker story, you got to get it right because that matters. <laughs> but this all of a sudden, so remember, I didn't take a second to think about the sevens 10 years earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now I thought, oh, man, this is the exact situation that I've already been in. Yeah. The hand's way better, but do I really want to risk my tournament here? And I I think I was hungry because we were many hours into it, and I was eating for the first time at a table, and I like, had a bite of this apple. And I thought, eh, what the hell? This kid doesn't know what he's doing. And before I could even see the flop, I remember Johnny Bax, who was his backer, like jumped up. And he was like, three! And I was like, oh, here we go again. And Jax versus three, three on the flop, and... Instead of being four-handed with an average stack, you are, I'm out, crippled, and then out. And oh right, and yeah. uh, at the time, like Ivy already busted out. Who, I mean, it's yes, he's the best player, but there's so much more to that in poker. You can be the best player, and it doesn't mean you're going to win. Yeah, uh, there's still some good players. I remember Darwin was there. Uh, Antoine Saut, who I had a lot of respect for. Yeah, he's gone on to made the final table again. Yeah, kid. Eric uh, Buckman has gone on to win a couple bracelets, I believe. Since now Buckman then. made a huge mistake. Buckman made a mistake that everyone in the world would think was a terrible move, and he let the guy who had no chips, Kada, double through. So Kada should have already been out or like yeah. just blinded down, but Buckman kind of handed him some chips. Buckman's a great player, by the way, but I didn't care for his play on that one because I was thinking that there's so much money in each jump mm-hmm. here. It's like a million bucks or whatever the case may be, but I was really, like, pissed off after that one because it's like, kid, I didn't need to do that. Like, mm-hmm. It's not like I was opening every hand. I was, like, the tight guy at the table, but the tight guy is going to make the call. And so You I was were like, mad at Cata for, for making that play with threes. I, well, I was mad that I lost, but I was like, that's such a poor play. Yeah. In the exact situation. Now... He's an excellent poker player. Uh, he'd been playing on poker stars. And, I mean, this was his exact ex- – like, this is what he trained for. I'm not a poker player that played nonstop, no limit. I don't have that – I mean, I played in a lot of events, but it's not like I was studying these guys who play online. They played a 1,000 times more hands than I played in no limit. Yeah, he was already a successful cash game grinder at that he time. He was a successful – and then he won a bracelet the next year. And last yeah. year he was so awesome watching – He and got I'm cheering for the main him. event, yeah. And this is like a super nice kid, but to me, I was like, I would have been retired. Yeah. I would have had like this beautiful house on Lake Washington, and next thing I know, I'm at like well, work the next day. Let's talk about your reaction to that one. So in 2000, you were happy when you busted out and then disappointed the next day. What was your reaction busting out that day? Depression. In 2009. I was very depressed because uh, at that point, I felt like I lost $7 million instead yeah. of... Winning two million, which of course is a ridiculous amount. I mean, that's yeah, it's awesome. It's life changing, but you know, in poker you're greedy, and when you get fifth place, it's like you don't remember everything that it took to get there. It's like the short term memory. Just like in poker, you like suck out on someone, and it's like, hey, wait a sec, you just got lucky on me a hand before, and you're like, hey, that was years ago. Yeah, who's thinking <laughs> about that now? Right. What have you done for me lately? <laughs> Um, and then how long do you think it took you to get over it? Or are we still waiting for that? <laughs> uh, you know, there's a, a con- it, very few people have made the main event final table twice. Uh, Joe Cotta being one of them, <laughs> um, especially since 2000. I mean, a lot of people did it back in the seventies and eighties when and nineties when it was smaller fields. Um, so you have that accomplishment to hang your hat on. Yeah. And, as much as I love poker, it's not the end all in life. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's tons of bad things happening in the world right now. And when I go and play poker, one of the reasons is to kind of forget about what's going out there. And, you know, I'll go to Bellagio, I'll play 4080 with my guys, and it's like the camaraderie is fantastic. But when did I get over it? Probably took a year, but I'm certainly not over it because I think of like, hey, it'd be certainly nice to have a – Extra $5 million. <laughs> <laughs> you know, things yeah, change. It's always got to creep back into your mind. Um, you think you'll you'll have a shot at another deep run in your career? Yes, but I think the poker's changed substantially since then. So it's really yeah, that was back 10 to, years ago. Yeah. Crazy. The one that was in the middle, when Moneymaker won, when I said I got 30th, I went out with 
a lot of chips actually, and Dan Harrington had aces, and I thought I had like a legitimate chance then because mm-hmm. I thought like the super satellites and the that I figured out the main event strategy. Like if I could write a book, this is exactly how you'd play the main event. And I remember a few years ago when uh, was it Pius Hines? What's his first name? Who? Hines, the guy who won. Hines, P.S. Hines, yeah. P.S. Hines. I watched. That's when they showed every single hand, and I thought, oh god. I hope I never get back here because there's no way I could compete with someone like that. Whereas back in the day, I thought I could take down like anyone. Mm-hmm. And it was like, you know, Ben Lamb and him and just like all these different levels. And I was like, whew, uh, you know, at least if I didn't have to show my cards, if these guys <laughs> ran over me, it'd be a different story. But here, I don't want to like make the wrong fold like 50 out of 50 times. Or it's like, here's a hand I have to go with and it's the wrong one. And that's when I realized that there's a new style of poker. And I, even like Daniel said that he's learned so much in the last few years uh, and changed his no limit play. And I just haven't played that much. Now I only play pretty much like four no limit events a year at the World Series. And I play some limit hold'em, a horse. And that's all the poker I get in. It, besides just playing 48 at Bellagio a couple times a week. Uh, and do I think I could get there if I have the right table draw? <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to make a mistake, and I still have, like, you know, you have to you have to be crazy every once in a while. But you have to be crazy at the right spots. Like, these guys that just call off all their chips with sevens like I did, I don't think that's the right play. That's not going to work. No. All right. Well, we uh, have some rapid-fire questions for you, if you don't mind getting to them. What's the biggest pot you've ever won or lost? In a cash game? Whatever you want to answer. Well, I mean, obviously, in, like, the main event. Term and equity, it's that. <laughs> so, I mean, there's plenty of those. Obviously, the losing's those, and I've had big hands there. But my biggest cash game, I was playing a, I don't know if it was 25, 50, or 50, 100. Uh, I was a, the only time I was ever in Bobby's room, I got involved in a hand with Chow. Uh, and I think it maybe I had Ace King. and This was a no limit game? This is no room? limit. It was like I got in early that morning and they were playing. I was like, oh, what the hell? So this is actually the only other time I played no limit it's in like the last like seven years. And he, I raised, he re-raised, I had Ace King suited, I called and came like a king on the flop and somehow we got it all in for like $25,000 each, like a total jackass and he had aces and I just was like, Oh my God, I'm an idiot. And then of course the king came and I was like embarrassed to take the pot. See, I still have that problem of, I feel like if you have the best hand, you're supposed to win. Wow. And I, and I'll give Chow credit. He didn't say anything for like 15 years to me. And then he brought it up a couple of years ago. He's like, you remember that? I was like, of course I remember it. And I apologize. <laughs> yeah. And one thing I always want to, that's One crazy. Thing that's, you still apologize for winning pots, though. Yeah. And, you know, back when I first started playing, I used to, like, care so much about how I played that I'd, like, educate people. And if they'd say, like, you know, you're the worst, and then I'd have to, like, explain, and that's just so wrong. And then, like, once you start understanding or you play live and you see how the grinders do it, it's like, let them think you're a sucker. And, you know, if you have the most money, then yeah. how much of a sucker are you? Exactly. It's, it's always the guys who show up in the cash games. They show up to work. They work their shift. They, they're anonymous. They take the money, and that's it. You know what I mean? That's the – a lot of people, that's what they strive for rather than, you know, getting to the top of the high roller circuit or something like that. Yeah, but poker's tough. I mean, it brings, like, the best and worst out of you. You can, like, <laughs> really, like, say stuff that you'd never say in real life at the poker table because – these guys just decide to, like, go off on you. <laughs> I've seen some of the nicest people in the world act real ugly at the poker table for sure. Yeah. When, when the when the run bad stretches into a while and the beats come in a certain order, yeah. Yeah, and when you play tournaments, uh, you go, like, a year without scoring. Yeah. And I used to t- joke about in baseball, like, if you, you can <laughs> be 30% and be, like, one of the best in the world, which is fail, like, a flat-out F everywhere else, but in poker tournaments, no one's 30%. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Best swap or piece you've ever had of anybody? Well, that <laughs> is there any background here when you ask that question? Because you, you can tell I, the story. I've always thought that I was like one of the greatest swappers of all time. Uh, really? And I think that's because so because of card player, I got in early with a lot of these people. I used to trade with Lane Flack, uh, Madison, um, 
David Chu and I, David's a hundred times the poker player I am. I've like never seen him make the wrong thing. And uh, I've certainly had some nice swaps with David Chu. And I was so happy. I remember happy. he handed me $30,000 once to give to you. <laughs> yeah. And I was so happy to pay him back when he had the piece of me at the World Series. But my, uh, my guy is Paul Phillips. Uh, really? A lot of people don't remember Paul. They used to call him dot com. We were like best friends at the time. Paul Phillips. I remember back in and the early to, WPT winner. Yeah, we used to swap five percent and mm-hmm. it's like he already put my kids through college. As he used <laughs> to say, like, Oh, here's another one for your kids because you know, we had kids at the same time. And then I had uh five percent of Diego when he won like that gigantic limit hold'em tournament at Commerce. Uh mm-hmm. I mean it sounds like I just piece myself out, but I don't. I just do like all these like little one percents. Except you have good timing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Here's a chance for you to maybe shout out one of your friends. Who's the best player we've never heard of? And I don't mean never heard of. I just mean people who don't get their credit, their full credit. Well, there's a so in the all I really do now is the cash games. Yeah. Cash so game these forty eighty Holden players. Uh, well, let's start with Ian Johns, who people have heard of. This guy can, like, play on his phone. Three-time bracelet winner or two? He's got a few. Uh, he's three. I call him champy because he just kept on winning that year. Maybe it's four. No, it's – is it four now? Three or four because uh, he won two that year. Ian does stuff in poker that I haven't really seen too many other people do, and people mm-hmm. just, like, shake their heads. I've seen him call it Jack High, which isn't my style, but he's right. <laughs> now, maybe he does it all the time, but I got – in my 48 year, when we play 100, 200, whatever the case may be – uh, he's not going to like this, but uh, one of my friends, Matt Gallen, just wins every single time. It's awesome. <laughs> he claims he doesn't. They always try to pretend that they don't win, but uh, just he just makes the right decision every time. And when you play cash, a lot of guys are the same, but there's, of course, the tilt factor in poker. And people like to pretend they don't tilt, but just by playing a hand differently, you know, when you're not running well, when you don't raise the turn, which could get you the hand, uh, this guy's just... He's like a robot, and he always crushes. Uh, another guy that I play with. It's uh, always funny that the cash game people never want to take any credit. They're like, "Oh, me? I'm I'm just nobody here. I'm just I'm playing for rig for the for the comps." Yeah. <laughs> for the, the comps. tournament player who who loses every year is like, "But look at all my caches, you know." Mm-hmm. Uh, Diego's an incredible limit hold'em player, but he doesn't really play as much anymore. And then a guy that I play with at Blasio now, uh, Jared Wooden. Sorry, Jared. Uh, <laughs> I made this joke a few years ago when he four bet me with a ace ten or a king ten. I said, "You keep doing that, you're gonna get demoted." <laughs> uh, but now I play with him all the time, and it's, you know, it's uh, you got to be very smart and aggressive and limit hold him and make the right play. And uh, he, in the last year that we've played, just seems that he just does the right thing all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, these are a couple of my forty eighty guys, but hey. A lot of people playing lower that would love to love yeah. to get to that level and be anonymous. <laughs> See, all the other guys I used to play with, they all became famous. But these are the guys who just kind of hang out and play cash. I'm not saying they win IRS. I'm just saying that I like the way they play. <laughs> uh, yeah, if anybody's listening, that matters. <laughs> right, all three listeners for my podcast. Thanks, What Olivia. What was your uh, worst job before poker? Uh, 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 you have any bad teenage jobs? No, because I was pretty much a counselor at my summer camp, which was, now when you say bad, I got paid like $400 for the entire summer of working 24 <laughs> hours a day, which is financially bad or poor, but I enjoyed it. And then I had that land acquisition job and then straight into poker. Yeah. So I only had like a few jobs. They didn't make you do any like dirty jobs on the, on the campsite? Uh, Well, I forgot to apply one year and my mom called and like, we've paid for 12 years find a job for him and they <laughs> they may be the sports director which was really being a camper and because all the counselors are slackers and so it's like someone had to like kind of run the show for each of their activities and it was like me playing softball hitting home runs and having the kids shag the ball <laughs> uh so okay as far as dirty work when i was younger my dad made me not made me he paid me five cents per like flyer that I put on cars and I would walk around and like put flyers for his like travel company on cars. And I remember doing that for a few days. Man, Barry's always hustling. He's a, yeah, type A. He really wanted me, he read a book on uh, Schwarzkopf once and he's like, oh, 
being a general in the army is great. I was like, pass. <laughs> and then he read one on the Hilton and he wanted me to go into hotel management. And again, this is back when I would like listen and do all this. He's like, I think you should go and hand out resumes today. So I had to go and this is like right out of college. Oh no, I was a junior in college. And I remember going to all these hotels and walking up and trying to hand my resume to just the person at the front desk. My heart was pounding. And I was just like, Whew, okay, I handed that one off. And I remember I walked at the Four Seasons in Seattle. And as I was walking out, after just like handing it to like a bellman, <laughs> uh, the Chicago Bulls with Michael Jordan and Rodman were in Seattle at the time when they awesome. won. Like they walked out right in front of me. And I was there for the exact second where I got to watch all the Bulls on the team bus. Now, that wasn't a job, but that was me attempting to get a job. That's a better story. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if not for poker, what would you be doing? I'm going to assume this eliminates card player, too, because no poker, no card player without poker. Uh, there's probably – I really think I would have been a good attorney. Um, now we've got a new project. Uh, I'm – Jimmy Fricky came up to me last year. He's a poker player. And one thing that we've wanted to do in card players is get into esports, and we haven't really figured out how. And Jimmy and I have been working on this project for about a year, and we're about to launch in about a month and a half. Uh, and it's kind of like card runners for esports. Mm -hmm. And that was a very successful model in poker. Well, it's still there, but we're going to do it for esports where we have training videos on how to get better at these games. And just to put in perspective, esports is like a hundred times bigger than poker. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. Well, they it'll just work. built an arena for it on the strip. Yeah, I'm not sure it'll work. It's a startup, but we have high hopes, and we're going after like some of these people that have six million YouTube followers or two yeah. and a half million uh, Twitter followers. And you know, Daniel's about as big as it gets in poker, and these guys are like six times bigger than them, and these aren't even the biggest. And yeah, just you know, I've got two kids now, and like they love Fortnite or these new games, and. Uh, have you been playing any games? No. I, <laughs> too I don't fast play it. for you? It is too fast. And plus the controls, it like, seems like it's the opposite direction. Like I tried to play Fortnite. And I thought I was looking up and I was looking down. Yeah. I got a little dizzy. But <laughs> the fact that these kids. I feel the same way. Now <laughs> they watch the videos. And it oh, yeah. it's like instead of TV, like this it's whole like generation. Better than movies. They'll watch people play video games. Yeah. And it. It really didn't make sense to me until Jimmy started telling me, like, you need to, like, see how this goes. And uh, Ian always stays at my house in Diego in the summer during the World Series. And I think my kids and Christy were in Florida last summer, and Ian had his little headset on, and he's in <laughs> Eli's room playing Fortnite. And Diego and I were like, okay, let's watch. And we <laughs> went in there, and Ian was still fairly new to the game, and I think he started with 100 people and he was like down to 20 and we're like down to two tables we're treating like <laughs> poker and then i was like final table down to nine and he said like someone needs to turn on the air conditioning uh turn on the fan and it was almost like he was having a panic attack because this game is like you're in war and we hadn't watched sweat it sweat dripping down his face yeah he was there. like oh, he's breathing hard and uh diego and i hadn't watched it before and we were just sitting there like blow his head off <laughs> and i'm like very anti-gun and uh, it was just really neat. And then it, like, hit me, like, hey, this is actually a spectator This is entertaining, sport. yeah. Uh, and it used to be that people would say, don't play video games. And now the parents are saying, don't watch the people play the video games. <laughs> um, but I saw it at that exact moment, and it was awesome. Uh, and this is, you know, Ian's just a chump, <laughs> a Fortnite <laughs> chump compared to, like, the studs. So yeah, imagine I if you're watching a top player, yeah. Yeah. And the thing that's amazing to me in the video gaming industry that I was told is that you're over the hill at 25 because you can't push the buttons fast enough. <laughs> that's crazy. And I think that's what I witnessed. Ian ended up getting second, and they were both there ready to shoot each other, and he just got shot, and it was over. And I was like, why don't you shoot him? And he's like, I, I tried. <laughs> I'm uh, too old. Yeah. Uh, I'm too old And then they become the coaches. <laughs> which, uh, you know, back to poker, you know, there's many ways to get good. Some people have coaches or some people read books some people just have the instinct uh and in poker i think that you either have it or you don't in a way like no matter how much you study if you don't have that trait you can't do it well you could do it but you're not gonna be the best yeah you need to have a weird reckless disregard for money but also respect it 
Yeah. You need to be a gambler, but know when to turn it off. There's yeah. something about the ideal poker player that's that I believe is hardwired in them. And you have to be hungry and like you need to want it. And I'm not sure I have that as much anymore. I'm not as competitive as I used to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't sit there and watch for every single tell at the table. Uh, I remember Dan Harrington once said, like, it's hard. You have to take breaks, like, when you're in the main event and, like, let go for an hour. But if I play cash, sometimes I go, like, all day without, like, really, like, focusing. Yeah. Now, that's limit hold'em, but it's very routinized to me. Yeah. Uh, headphones on at the table, yes or no? And if so, what are you listening to? Uh, it all depends. I used to be 100% headphones. And then when they made you take it off, once you got down to two tables, it like really screwed me up. But I remember Eric Seidel said something once, like people say stuff. And I just took it off once pre making the money on that money maker year. And I heard this guy say that he wouldn't even consider going bust at this point without Kings. And I just like played back at him like six times in a row. I mean, that stuff matters. Thanks for the blueprint, buddy. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, People say stuff that they shouldn't. So now... I think if I lose a few hands in the cash game, I'll put on the headphones just to chill me out. So I either listen to like a podcast of my like old Seattle sports radio station that I used Mm -hmm. to listen to. Uh, I listen to a little Grateful Dead to calm me down. Uh, We played some golf with uh, some some, uh, Bob Marley playing. I know you're into. Yeah. Uh, Julio's my golf buddy. Talking about tilting. <laughs> but golf's also helped me out uh, lately as far as you just, it's nice to get outside. I spent like three years of just being at the poker tables or at work when I started to play a lot of cash. And it was like, it's not good for the life to just only do that. You have to get out and do other things. And especially in Vegas when there's a lot of sun, it's just nice to get out there. And I, I feel like I suck at golf, but it's still fun because uh, as far as being competitive. We have time to get good. Yeah, and it's I don't feel like I play against you when we play. I feel like I'm playing against myself, and it's just I want to get a little better against myself. And we don't play for money because we both suck. And <laughs> if I can't hit a four foot putt, why would I consider gambling on it? But yeah, I start I, sweating like Ian. <laughs> <laughs> Ian's a great golfer. Uh, it, it's whenever I listen to music. So I used to for poker in the tournaments, depending on how I wanted to play. If I realized that I was playing too tight, I'd listen to some like upbeat music to get me to go. If I was playing too fast, I'd slow it down, listen to Bob Murray, Grateful Dead. So I would intentionally like listen to music based on how I wanted to change my play at the time. All right. It works. Part play some speed metal when uh when you're too tight then. <laughs> yeah. We end the podcast the same way every time with a question from the random question generator. Which by the way I believe is done by Washington University. Uh if you lost all of your possessions but one what would you want it to be? And I, I assume family's not count as a possession. <laughs> uh, well, it used to be my computer, which had all the photos. Uh, I don't think the I, photo album is always the best answer. But I mean, now it's all in the cloud. That's uh, true. I'm. I'm not, not sure I have any possessions that are that important. Yeah. Besides my family and my dog, but. Uh, I would have to say, and you don't have no, any like famous memorabilia in your house you'd pull, or not off the head that I could think of. What's my okay? I have a picture uh, of the Grateful Dead that's hanging up that I've never seen before, and this guy Olvis Alberts, who was a poker, he was a photographer, but he also dabbled dabbed in poker for a while, uh, and this is from like 1967 that was kind of played a free concert in our neighborhood. And then I have a bunch of tapes. Yeah, that'd be super cool. You gotta save that. When I was in, yeah, when I was in college, there was all my tapes, but now everything's online. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I don't really have a possession that's that important to me. That's good. Let it all go. No attachments. Jeff, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I hope there's uh, more than you and me listening to this one. Oh, there, there will be. <laughs> you'll, you'll be surprised how popular this episode is. Yeah, hey, thanks, Julio. Thank you. That's it. That's the show. Thank you once again to the boss man himself, Jeff Shulman, for letting me twist his arm into coming on the podcast. Special shout out to the family, Christy and the kids, Lucy and Eli, who may one day listen to this. You can see Jeff never tweet from his account at Happy Shulman, or just keep on coming back to Card Player to see what he's up to. 
If you like the show, go ahead and subscribe. You can do us a huge favor by leaving a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get this show. Let us know about your review with an email to pokerstories at cardplayer.com and you'll receive a free digital subscription to Card Player Magazine. Thanks for listening.